Welcome to WOW, the Woman of the Week podcast series by PharmaVoice. This episode was made possible by a generous sponsorship from Ogilvy Health. For more information, visit ogilvyhealth.com. In this episode, Taryn Grome, Editor-in-Chief of PharmaVoice Magazine, meets with Kimberly Haugstead, CEO, Global Genes. Kimberly, welcome to the Pharma Voice Wild podcast program. Well, thank you for having me. I'm a pleasure to be here. I saw you recently at the annual Global Genes Conference uh, out in San Diego. I thought you did a fabulous job. And I want to say congratulations on your recent appointment as CEO of Global Genes. Oh, well, thank you so much. It's been a whirlwind, but I am absolutely loving it. So let's talk about your whirlwind. You've been in the job just about two months. What has been your biggest aha moment so far? Ah, the aha moment. You know, I've had the true honor of spending some time with the rare rock stars, many of the rare rock stars, uh, scientists uh, like Raya Taft or David Fagenbaum, but also really those many, many, many patients and families that we had an opportunity to meet at the summit uh, who have found Global Genes to be that community uh, where they can belong to this big collective of rare. Uh, it's, it's really beautiful and inspiring, but I think maybe beyond that even, an aha moment for me in coming and putting all of this together and visiting and spending time at the summit was that partner realization. Uh, this is truly a time uh, for rare in, in the world right now, and really that opportunity to partner with everyone, uh, patients, researchers, industry, payers, the governments uh, around the world, uh, rare, rare is the time. And we can really role model as an organization to bring this true partnership uh, together and drive forward. So huge aha moment about how important those partnerships can be. That's excellent. And those partnerships, as you said, really are starting to bear some fruit, if you will. Um, you know, there was a siloed system for quite some time, but I think you might agree or not agree that there's been a huge movement towards dissolving those silos and moving the disparate uh, stakeholders closer together. Yeah, I, absolutely, absolutely. And I think it's a, it's a non-optional, and uh, patients are really at the core of that. I think that the patient community is, is really instrumental in this movement to drive us together and drive forward. And uh, it's critical, and it's, it's an amazing time to be a part of this world. So talk to me about how your role as CEO and president of the Hemophilia Federation of America prepared you to lead Global Genes. Sure. Okay. Well, I suppose the obvious, uh, having built a specific disease area focused nonprofit certainly gives me a lot of insight into the, the challenges, the opportunities um, that our partner foundations have. Uh, running and expanding a nonprofit, uh, certainly that experience uh, comes with this. Uh, I grew the organization that I worked with. In the, the 11 years we were there, we grew year over year every single year, so we had a wonderful run. Uh, and the time I spent in hemophilia had so many opportunities to try and flex new things and always be striving forward. And frankly, the, the staff, I have to take just a second and acknowledge the amazing team uh, that, that I worked with um, at the organization at, at HFA. They made it easy to do what we did. But I think maybe the true benefit uh, from joining HFA and being a part of hemophilia, uh, when I joined, I was following my heart. Uh, I had a very young son at the time with hemophilia, and my passion was really all about kids with bleeding disorders and what was in their future. Uh, it was very personal. Um, I didn't really worry if I had questions or you know, something that I might have to ask or want to ask that others might not like, because I needed to know and I wanted to know for our kids. And so putting that elephant in the room out on the table and really pushing for true discussion and problem solving so we could address whatever was on the table and truly move forward uh, was, was just an, an absolute. And I remember, oh gosh, it was probably almost 10 years ago, really being taken aback uh, at my time there, a very, very senior executive at a biotech company. I won't, I won't name his name, um, but lovely guy, uh, called to bend my ear uh, about something uh, before he proceeded down some path or other. And uh, it wasn't him calling me that really struck me. I'd had a lot of conversations with him, uh, but in the conversation, he made it so clear 
that he knew I was going to poke holes in his idea, and he was calling me ahead of time so he could get them all on the table and address them proactively. And I realized how important it was to be fearless and courageous to truly ask those tough questions. Um, and I think going forward to Global Genes, certainly I can bring that to the table. And it was just it was that, that piece that I learned about just taking that risk and being fearless uh, and willing to put it out there no matter what that change might be. I Excellent. loved what I was do, doing at HFA, but honestly, it's, it's an amazing time in hemophilia. And there are so many options and gene therapy is even on the horizon. And so what, uh, within the next year, I'd really actually even expect gene therapy to be approved in hemophilia. So my original reason for coming into hemophilia, he's, he's 17 uh, and he's doing pretty well. And I feel like this is his time going forward where I can, I can really take that gift I was given in the last decade and, and learn. And, and I learned and I saw so much and, and hopefully I can bring that to the broader, broader rare community today. That's wonderful. So let's talk about what's in the future for Global Genes. What does your 100-day plan look like? Ooh, well, we're well into that now, aren't we? Yes. Um, yeah. so, <laughs> day, what are we? Um, day what? <laughs> oh, gosh, it's close to two months, so it's, uh, it's amazing, and it's been, it's been crazy. Um, so, you know, I've, I've really been doing a lot of listening and, and learning. This is the time to really get in, and, you know, the honeymoon is on right now. The honeymoon will soon be over. Um, there, there are just so many opportunities. Uh, awareness and, and education at Global Genes is so incredibly essential and critical to what we need to do to support our families and foundations. Uh, and I'm spending a lot of time looking at our partnerships and how we can work and, and role model that to, true collaborative work to get there. Um, but I think the big key here for Global Genes is really scaling to reach more. There are 400 million people in the world uh, potentially with a rare disease and 30 million in the United States alone. So there's just a tremendous opportunity to uh, provide support. So really taking a hard look at how we can, we can really engage in this word called scale uh, and really, really ramp up. What are some of the things you're looking specifically to do in terms of scaling up? We're taking a real look at the work that we've done to date and where there is opportunity to really bring things together under common umbrellas or themes. Uh, we are taking a really detailed look at a program we have called the Concierge uh, Service, Rare Concierge. And Rare Concierge today is, you know, is an opportunity to reach, to reach out to us uh, through our, our system and, uh, and speak with someone, potentially get connected with a genetic counselor, and, and really help on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And we're taking a lot of um, look and thought uh, and time um, to spend looking at how we might be able to, to scale that build an infrastructure, uh, likely a technical infrastructure, in addition to the people infrastructure, to be able to make that accessible and uh, available to folks uh, really worldwide um, at a future point. Uh, so that's a big piece. We're also doing a lot of uh, work looking at how we as an organization um, do partner. We have recently established a research alliance in addition to the corporate alliance and uh, patient foundation alliance that we have, so creating that full triangle and putting some effort into how we, we truly engage across these different spectrums. And, and again, it all comes back to that partnering and how we can work together and build that infrastructure so we are a, a united force within RARE to get things done. So, you know, obviously because it is rare disease, there are very few patients sometimes in some of those disease states. But what are some of the commonalities you see running through the rare disease community? And how can Global Genes connect and knit those commonalities together to better help patients? Sure, that's an awesome question. Uh, so I think the, the biggest part here is that we're all human, and no matter what your diagnosis is, you still, you're getting a diagnosis and learning how to absorb that diagnosis and understand what its meaning and its implication might be. Um, wondering and, you know, fearing what's out there, what's next, what's possible for me, all, all folks with rare uh, walk down that path, and, um, and, and then it's the journey, right? So the, the reality is we're all coming together as, as humans uh, with rare disease, and it is, it is a tremendous opportunity and honor and privilege for us at Global Genes 
to be able to help along that path, to address along that journey and along your lifespan as a newly diagnosed family with a baby in their arms through taking that individual. Maybe that baby is going to school now, and how do you transition? Maybe that baby is now a teenager and you're transitioning, and maybe in college again as a young adult transitioning, and how, how are you as a young adult with a rare disease coping and, and dealing and managing with your, your situation and, and forward. Um, so I think the reality is, um, we're, again, we're all human, and so our responsibility is to help along that whole continuum. So what is it that makes Global Genes unique in your perspective? Oh, I would say we have uh, that California edgy, willing to be a little different approach down pat. Um, it's, it's an amazing part of what we do. Uh, we're, we're not operating inside the beltway of Washington, D.C. Uh, we are um, just really flexible, really open, and it is incredibly beautiful being a little bit different and a little edgy. Uh, to match that with being incredibly approachable and accessible. And what we do amazingly well is we do welcome people, I guess, into the fold, so to speak. We work really, really hard to do that. And we believe, I think, inherently no one with a rare disease should be alone. And so, um, so we, we, we want to be here and be approachable. We also really look at wanting to say yes. Uh, so it isn't about, no, that's not what we do or we've never done that before. But as an organization, culturally, we're always looking at this opportunity to look at, to look at the forward path. Uh, it might not always be a yes right now, uh, but uh, I think uh, we're always looking ahead to what's coming next. Um, in fact, we did the, the next report. Uh, actually, the irony of our next report, which is a, a report that is the first of its kind uh, comprehensive report looking at over 50 different uh, players in the rare disease field, and this next report that we published just this fall uh, really, really takes a look at you know, patients as drivers in this whole process of, uh, of rare disease. But next in itself, the irony as our organization looks forward is we were, we were doing the next report initially because we were looking back at the first 10 years of, uh, of global genes. Uh, but inherently, because of who we are, we couldn't just do a look back. We had to look at what was coming forward and ended up calling the publication next. Uh, so I think it's just inherent and, and natural in what we do to look, look to the future. That's excellent. Let's talk about the future. What do you think is driving so much interest today in the rare disease community? There are a lot more players than there ever have been before. Yeah, isn't it wonderful? Fantastic. Yes, it's um. exciting. <laughs> Um, so I think it's a merging of multiple things. Uh, certainly uh, the, the science is, is progressing and continues to move forward. Uh, we have uh, also an, an emergence of new technology uh, with gene, uh, gene sequencing and other tools. We're able to look so much deeper into ourselves and, and, and from an identification and diagnosis standpoint, it's, it's accessible. Uh, and I think there's just tremendous opportunity uh, as, a, as a planet, uh, as, as we're a you know, shrinking community in a planet in the sense that we're all connected more and more. There's more opportunity for us to connect as rare disease, even those individual diseases that have, you know, 2, 4, 6, 10, or 20 people on the planet. We're now able to find those individuals and really come collectively together, apply the science, apply the technology, and it's, it's I guess, a bit of a secret sauce in, in how we um, were able to really drive forward today. There's, you're right. There's a ton of interest, and we welcome it. it it's, just, it's an amazing opportunity to provide really great opportunities for our, our families. You know, somebody at the conference uh, said, and I'm paraphrasing here, that with the cost of genome sequencing coming down mm -hmm. so significantly, that it could right. potentially be possible to do real-time drug development for rare disease patients. Do you mm -hmm. see this as a possibility? I wouldn't shut anything down as a possibility. Absolutely not. And yeah, we're, we're seeing where sequencing used to take, you know, months and months can now be done in a few days. The you know, Radies Hospital in California uh, actually is doing sequencing um, at, at the uh, pediatric level and um, in turning things around incredibly quickly and truly saving lives because of it. So it's, it's a very, very powerful time. Kimberly, what is it about the non-profit sector that excites you? You're now working in two large organizations that really take a different approach to partnerships, et cetera. So what is it about the nonprofit sector that uh, drew you in? 
Hmm. That's such an interesting question. Uh, my, my immediate reaction is that other than staying compliant to the rules of a 501c3, I, I don't really spend a lot of time thinking about being a part of a nonprofit. My background uh, originally was, was corporate and uh, worked, uh, worked in um, the, the IT sector, I worked in the investment sector, I uh, had a private consulting practice for a while, and I uh, was a corporate girl all the way. Uh, but uh, frankly, you know, it's just a designation, the nonprofit uh, status. Uh, 501c3, a friend uh, always says to me, is just an IRS designation for a business. And uh, I really <laughs> agree with that concept. You know, we're, we're running a, a business here. Our business has a mission, and that mission is not to make money. <laughs> our mission is truly to serve our patients and families. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking to change the world here. We want to improve the lives of everyone impacted by a rare disease. Uh, and I think that's a pretty powerful mission to and, and, and purpose to have as an organization. So, um, so yeah, really, really don't look at the nonprofit as a nonprofit. It's just a new avenue, a different avenue for business. You just talked about your varied career uh, perspectives. How has that influenced your leadership style? Well, I, I guess I would say I'm an eclectic mix <laughs> of uh, uh, I'm, I'm competitive, certainly. I suppose you'd say I'm a driver. Uh, I wouldn't ask any more from my team, however, than I'd be willing to do myself, but I always expect stretch. Uh, so, you know, the good to great concept, always striving for great. Uh, I guess I believe very much, and, and not a guess, I truly do believe in the concepts of servant leadership. So from a style perspective, servant leadership certainly is one thing I believe truly in. I love the opportunity to be a part of building a team, supporting fellow employees as they continue to grow. And it's, it's just such an honor to watch, uh, watch a team blossom. It's, it's a privilege. But I also on that same front, I'm, I'm, I'm really committed to driving progress and bringing a team together and working towards a future horizon and vision. So building a team that supports each other during a transformation is just incredibly exciting. And I think that's truly where we're at here at Global Jeets today. Uh, so eclectic, I suppose, is the way I'd really answer your question. Excellent. As a CEO, you're in a rarefied group. There just aren't that many women CEOs, nonprofit or for-profit, let's be honest. So you are really a role model for so many other women. How do you gauge success for yourself? And then how do you celebrate those successes? Thank you for the question. And, um, you know, I am seeing in, 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 the, in the world that I have been in the last 10 years, I, I've seen a real progress and change with female leaders playing a bigger and bigger part. Maybe not always the CEO yet, but definitely entering that senior level of, of management. And I'm really proud of that. And it's uh, uh, it, you know, maybe speaks to, uh, to the fact that I'm not a new kid on the block anymore, that when I've seen some individuals who have grown in their career uh, while I've been in this industry, I feel really good about that and, uh, and personally celebrate that. Um, from a gauging success for myself, I don't know that I think of, I probably am a terrible role model at this. I, I just, I love the team success. Uh, so really, really celebrating and, um, and appreciating and, and watching those relationship grows, grow gives me just deep satisfaction uh, in, in seeing and in, um, in truly seeing that happen. Um, yeah, celebrating is, is for me, it's, it's the good to great you know, path. So I guess small celebrations and really recognizing a team, uh, team success is so much more important to me than, than acknowledging maybe my own. Very good. If you had to look back, um, you know, wind up that way back machine, is there a piece of advice you would give to your younger self, something you know now that you wish you knew then? So the piece of advice that I, I think that I would give my, myself if I could do it all over again is to be planful but truly take even more risk and push the envelope. Remind myself or, or just really offer that you only get this time once and make it meaningful. Wonderful. Can you identify for me one wow moment of your career, something that maybe impacted you so significantly that it stays with you or that changed the trajectory of your career? I would love to share, um, and there are examples floating around in my head right now that, uh, that I, I, I just have to pull one out, and I think – I could talk about getting our materials into the Smithsonian with the Hemophilia Federation or, or some other big achievements, 
But there's one that was really incredible, and it was a tiny moment in time, and it was an interaction with an individual named Rodney. Uh, and Rodney uh, was a, a person, is a person living with, with hemophilia. And uh, I was at a meeting, you know, a national meeting here in the U.S., and had attended, I think I was, I was presenting earlier in the day and attended a session just I was at the meeting. And the session that was presenting was talking about um, just really taking a moment. It was, it was a self-care kind of session. It was kind of fun to be a part. And it was, uh, it was speaking to writing down on a card, you know, who's really impacted you and what that impact was and, you know, whatnot. And it was, it was very sweet. And I didn't think a lot about it. I think I had another session I was presenting later in the day and, uh, and moved forward. And uh, later that evening, uh, a gentleman, this gentleman Rodney, came up to me. And uh, he pulled me aside. And it was a very sort of weird conversation in that we, we hadn't been, you know, we hadn't connected in a while. I had known him for a while, just randomly had had some conversations. And he's just a beautiful guy just a wonderful man, um, living with a lot of life challenges uh, in his 50s, uh, had severe hemophilia and all of the comorbidities that go with that, uh, so a lot of disability issues. Um, he hadn't gone to college or, you know, further, you know, educationally because of, you know, financial issues and, and living, you know, the life he was in. However, he was a brilliant man, and I had had conversations with him over the years uh, just about big dreams, um, green energy and, you know, all kinds of crazy things. Um, so lovely guy. And he walks up to me and I was talking with someone else and he you know, waited patiently and respectfully for that conversation to, to happen. And then he, he stopped in and he handed me this little piece of paper and he said, I just wanted to give you this. And then he turned and walked away. And, and I thought, well, that was, you know, it's different, but okay, you know, he's a sweet man. What, what is this? And I opened up the note and it, it was a note it said something along the lines of, thank you so much. You've listened to me and you've cared about who I am. And that was it. Huh. Ah. it was beautiful. I know, I know. It was so beautiful. And it, it, it drew me. I mean, I literally had to walk away. I think I, I ran to the ladies' room for a minute because I needed a moment just to, you know, just to think about this. You know, this is, this is an individual, a beautiful, wonderful, brilliant individual um, who, who gave me the gift of those beautiful words so incredibly powerful, but I hadn't done anything. Uh, he was still living in poverty, still had bleeds, you know, still, still all of the comorbidity issues that, that go with that, living in constant pain, struggling, but he felt valued and he felt heard. And I've never, ever forgotten that every single person matters and taking the time and, and the moments that you spend while you might not be able, able to actually do, you know, something actionable, there is, there is something you're doing, and you're giving, giving someone just that little bit of being heard and a little bit of a voice. And I really hope, um, and, and Global Genes is set um, and, and really uh, models this already, and part of my, my, my desire and, and, and interest in coming on board is to continue to further that with the whole rare uh, disease community. That's an amazing story. I can't even imagine how moved you were at the time and what a wonderful thing to pay forward and remembering that gentleman's words. Thank you so much for joining us for our WOW podcast program, and I want to wish you tremendous success as you go forward in leading Global Genes into its next decade. Oh, thank you so much. It's, uh, it's been my pleasure being a part of, our, of the podcast, and I can't wait for what's coming forward. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of WOW, the Woman of the Week podcast series. And thanks again to Ogilvy Health for sponsoring this episode. For more information, visit ogilvyhealth.com. And don't forget to check out our other episodes at pharmavoice.com slash wow. This 2019 program is copyrighted by PharmaLinks, LLC.